All right. And grab a drink of water right over here. And then I'll get started on today's today's topic. All right, social algorithms one. That's that's the most creative name I could come up for this one because there's more than one. So I had I, rather than give them each cool names, I just well, I numbered them. It does make keeping them organized a little bit more simple though. So social algorithms one. Uh, this is going to be an introduction to the concept of what a social algorithm is, and some simple examples of how social algorithms can be recognized and navigated reliably. Um, the people who would find this offensive would be would be people who um, who don't like to have emotions analyzed beyond a certain point. And everyone has a different level of tolerance for what that means. But unless you get all the way down to the fear responses, then usually you're putting up some kind of layer over that to steer you away from it. And why wouldn't you? Because those are unpleasant places to be. So if, if your emotion isn't mapped all of that way, then you're not going to want to know that there's a map of it because to know that there's a map of it means to explore the parts of it that you instinctively wish to avoid. Uh, and we're very good at avoiding things that, that make us, we're very good at knowing when fear is appropriate. Uh, and I don't mean that in the sense that, that fear always gives us good advice, but we're very good at knowing when our perspective ends and something new begins. And we can sense that with deadly accuracy, and we have to. And it's a survival mechanism. You have to know on some level what your limits are. And fear is kind of the gateway to limitation, because if you can pass through it, well, the fear is a one-time thing. You never will be afraid of something that you fully understand. You might respect it. You might uh, recognize its potential and its, and its intensity and its energy, but you won't fear it because everything that it does will make sense. And that's, that's how fear works, that's how it keeps us alive. Because there's going to be things that are new that we don't know about that just so happen to be dangerous and would kill us or require a very specific type of interaction to be useful instead of harmful. And if we don't know what any of those answers are, then to stay away and to avoid is, uh, is a very rational response in the physical realm where there are consequences. But in the realm of consciousness, that's, we take that behavior and we put it in the mind and we don't understand that the mind has very different rules of survival than the physical world. Um, but now you can take those things which enable survival and create appropriate metaphors, which I'll do, but the, the requirements for survival are different. Uh, like physical survival is, is pretty simple. You know, if you die because it happens, if you, you, know, if you shouldn't have let that happen. And fear and avoidance is the way to avoid that because that outcome is clearly mapped uh, and you end up dead. So yes, that's appropriate. But when you take that into the realm of the mind, the mind is not a thing that can only exist as one point. We, can, we have an imagination. We can become astronauts and firefighters and policemen and, and politicians and people on TV and anybody we want in our imagination. And we can do that as quick as we can imagine it. Well, which one of those is real? Well, technically, none of them. Right? Sure. But which one of those ideas is real? All of them. They exist as ideas, and you made them, and they're brand new. So what you have done is you have expanded the capacity of your mind to understand things that it has not experienced directly, at least by simulation. Right? You can pretend. And because we can pretend, 
we can imagine a thousand ways that something is wrong without consequence while we search for the one specific way that it is right. And that is how consciousness grows. So instead of imagining the center of the self as this stable point, you need to imagine the center of the self as a seed that is surrounded by things that will kill it. And there are paths through each of those things that will kill it. And that is specific ways of thinking that balance limitation and potential and leave free will intact at the center. Because if your understanding of anything doesn't revolve around the point of is my personal free will preserved, you have reached the limits of your free will and you no longer behave as a creature of free will. until at each point here's the choice that i'm making and now i understand how it's a choice and why it's a choice and now i can use that information to give myself other choices that's consciousness growing but in the mind there is there's a punishment for getting it wrong and that is admitting that you got it wrong and that price is felt at a gut level because the disappointment is real. And as all of that swims around, people equate this negative feeling that is associated by whatever inadequacy or frustration they're fighting. And they associate that feeling with the, the, the process of problem solving it from multiple angles. Well, I tried that once already. And it ended badly. And I don't want to feel that way again. Well, if you tried it once and there's 20 million wrong ways to do it, and the way that you tried it wrong can eliminate half of those because you know exactly where it went really wrong, then this process of trial and error becomes something that you can navigate to quickly find the path through but the price of that is guessing wrong and figuring out enough about the science of guessing to know how to walk your guesses in like that like a shooter on a target who they call it walking in the target where previous shots give information about their distance from the goal and that information can be used to narrow in on that goal but every time there's a correction that's felt at a deep level, a deep level that says, I didn't understand how reality works and that scares the crap out of me. And it made me feel powerless and weak. So I'm not gonna think about that feeling. I'm just never gonna imagine a different way again because I know this way is correct. And even if that makes me walk in circles and repeat the same pattern, nothing you can say or do will rec make me recognize that I am not walking in a straight line because that's what I see, and that's the mindset. If you're walking in a straight line and you keep passing the same things, you're really walking in a circle. That's the truth of it. And it's nobody's fault but the person who sees the circle, or sees the circle as a straight line. Only so much you can do on that front. So I'm gonna put my question in the dojo. Okay. So it hasn't popped through yet. So well, I said I'm going to. Um, oh, your okay, statement, I, I felt comfortable interrupting because I think it would be helpful to hear that statement again. If you're walking in a straight line, or at least maybe for me to repeat it. Um, yeah, if you're walking in a straight line and passing the same things, then you're walking in a circle. Yes. And I can't find the dojo on my computer. Oh, there it is. So I think my computer's just slow. I'm going to mute myself. So tying that to the concept of, of social algorithms, yeah, that was that was a lot to say, but what I did was map how deep the information about social algorithms can go. And what I'm saying is I'm mapping how deep human behavior can be understood. So it's it's always about reduction, right? If I can see 10 million things and understand the truth and 
another person can see 10,000 things inside of that 10 million and find the same truth. The person who can see less things and get the same truth has a weaker perspective of that truth. They, they've arrived at that truth, but they don't understand it as completely as the person who saw more. However, if the person, a third person comes along and they can see 25 things that explain all 10 million, if they are arranged in a certain order, what they have done is they have found a truth beneath what is commonly understood. So it's about depth in that sense. How complex can you explain what is happening? Which is different to say, how well can you understand what is happening? Certain things are understood simply, um, but that only gives that simple understanding one point of reference. It's true, which means you can know that it's true, but you have no idea what to do with it beyond that because the potential doesn't end there. It actually begins there. So the finish line is often mistaken for a starting point or what could be a new starting point. And so whoever can take the last farthest finish line and turn that into a starting point where they end somewhere else, that person has a wider view that is outside of the view of everything else. And so why, why do I say that? What I'm saying is that there are layers of understanding. That person made me angry. Okay, that person who just says that, they know that they feel mad. And maybe that's all they know. And fair enough. They at least know what to do with that. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go hit them. I'm gonna go do something else. So that person, they understand that that person did that thing and that made them angry. Okay. So maybe the next person, same situation, different people. So let's not cross the stream. We're all isolated cookie cutter examples. Next person comes along and says, that person made me angry. And they made me angry because they heard a kick. Okay, well, that person has more self-awareness than the first person, or at least they're able to express it. And then a third person might come along and say, they heard a kid and I got hurt when I was a kid. So I understand what that feels like. Well, now that's a third layer. And another person could come along and say, and every kid who has felt powerless in their life has a tendency to retrieve into their own imagination and suppress their memories. Okay, so that person now understands a lot more than the person who said that guy made me angry. The person at the end of that line understands that their childhood may have impacted them in ways they were previously uh, unable to see. Well, then a fourth person or a fifth person could come along and say, well, when you trace back issues of control, they're really feelings of powerlessness that stabilizes a person's ability to perceive reality, leaving them in a constant state of uncertainty and nervousness. This was just a source of ADHD, depression, anxiety, lack of social interaction, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the person who said all of that at the end will not disagree with the first person who said that person made me angry. I guarantee you, the person who said that person made me angry will not believe a word that is said by the last person in that line because they don't understand that those concepts even exist because they're walking in a straight line when they're really walking in a circle that is guided by topography that, that they have the ability to change if they become aware that that is what is influencing them. So that's the core idea behind social algorithms. There's always a pattern beneath the pattern. That's the idea. And all that is to say is the same thing about the universe that I've said in previous lectures, which is your ideas create boundaries. Everything that is in your idea, everything that is at the border of your idea where your idea creates itself and everything that is not covered by your idea. So the goal in any situation, if you're trying to use a, a, an algorithm or a predictive model of any kind, is to have an idea that is bigger than the subset within that idea. 
So there is no part of an idea that is unmapped because it is completely contained. And there are bits around it that are unknown to the smaller thing that is contained inside it. So it'd be, a, it'd be like a, a, an egg and a yolk, okay? So the egg yolk is its own thing, then the white around it, and then the shell. So if you can ever reach the level of egg white, then anything that you can see the egg yolk, uh, you would understand that the egg yolk can't see what you see and you can interact with it in ways that are spooky and fucked up and counterintuitive and, and hilarious and ironic and you name it. So that's, that's, the, uh, that's the sales pitch, as it were, for the perspective of what makes social algorithms possible. Um, people don't understand themselves as well as you could. And that's a dangerous statement because you have to be able to recognize where you are on the ladder of perspective very quickly. And you need to know where something else is on the ladder of perspective very quickly. And you need to get it right because as with anything, social algorithm is a machine it's in there. So let's talk about the definitions. Social algorithm. There's only two words, so it shouldn't take very long. Social. That means anything that has to do with people interacting with each other. Okay? Any form of communication or, or transmission of thoughts, feelings, ideas, etc. That is that is covered by the term social. That's pretty short for me for a definition. It took less than five minutes. Algorithm. Okay, so this one is, is a computer word. And it means a series of logical steps that will take an input and produce a predictable outcome, okay? So another way to say that would be a math formula. Uh, y equals mx plus b, that's an algorithm. It explains the behavior of y. Y equals, and then there's the algorithm, mx plus b. And that's the algorithm for why. So to create, to, to say that this is a social thing, well, here's the thing. If you're going to use an algorithm, you need to use computer language in whatever you build because the algorithm is the language of, uh, of computer programming. That's where we can break it down into ones and zeros. If and then. So you need certainty for an algorithm to work. And there is only one place in the universe where certainty can be created. And that is a moment of indecision. A thing that was previously unknown became visible and is uncertain until the person who observes it understands it, then it becomes certain. So when a thing is understood, that means choices are being made about what it is and what it is not. That is free will. I can look at, at a painting and say, this picture is good. Well, that's a binary distinction. I could have said this picture is bad. And let's say those are my only two choices. If I had a button and they were taking votes for the picture, is this picture good or is this picture bad? I could say this picture is good. And, and so now that's a one. This picture is bad. That's a zero. Ones and zeros. So now what I can do is I can say that 80% of people, they think my picture is good and 20% mean that my picture is bad. So if I was selling that picture, I would take that social behavior, which is opinion, and I would compare my painting to historically successful paintings. And I would find out what my picture has in common that people are resonating with, that made them like it, and see if I can find those common trends. Uh, if I can find those common trends that uh, unite those pictures. So I gotta move something here so I can't see it. There we go. Um, 
exist. So I can find those pictures. Um, and I would use that information to make my next painting, right? I'm gonna take this theme and this theme and this theme because 80% of people like my last picture and my picture has this and this and this in common. So I'm gonna work on those things and really accentuate them and see if those are the strength behind the people's opinion. So what you've done now is you've taken a social behavior and converted it into a plan for success. So that's, that's, that's the very weakest of social algorithms. That's the observation of a social algorithm, okay? So you haven't done anything with it. You just recognize a pattern, which, hey, that's where it starts because that's, you're gonna need to find little patterns uh, as examples before you'll ever be able to build your own. So I can tell you that anyone with affinity for computer programming has an affinity for the language of social algorithms. Uh, I can also tell you that the people who need to learn social algorithms the most, if their goal is to have maximum access to their total potential, are the people who are the absolute worst at computer programming. So take with that what you will. If you want to reach the absolute pinnacle of your potential and you suck at computer programming, then this is something that will hold you back um, eventually because this is where it goes, the combination of the two extremes. Um, or you can cheat and get a really good imagination, which can automatically assume the opposite of what you're thinking and fill in all the gaps based on that hypothetical information. But you have to be really good at the opposite game for that to work. So if you can take everything you believe and imagine the opposite of it is true, and then figure out what those two things have in common, you'll double your brain size with one exercise. But your brain's sneaky, and there's a lot of them that it's not going to want to update because of reasons that will become illogical after you update. Um, but you're going to avoid those, and you won't even know you're doing it. So you really got to stay on top of that list. Um, that's a little aside there, but that's how you, that's the cheater's guide to, to upgrade your brain in, in two days. Uh, but it's only good for one shot. And that's really Taoism, if you want to get down to it. I learned Taoism so much that you understand the good and the parts of yourself that you don't like. That's a different way of saying that, but that's a harder way to say that. Better to make it sound like you're gaming the system than you're actually becoming more vulnerable about your limitations and being honest about them. But it's the same thing. It's the same thing. You don't have to have it hurt to have it happen. Can you relate it to the matrix and the spoon? Uh, okay, so somebody says, I want you to bend this spoon. And you say, I can bend that spoon or I can't bend that spoon. The little girl says, there is no spoon because it's a projection of the matrix. Does that help? It's you're asking- So that's one. directly applicable here in the same way? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, what I would say is if you can't imagine a thing and imagine its opposite and figure out what that total thing is talking about, you're either asking the wrong question or looking at it from a perspective that is flawed. Um, or incomplete would be a better way to say it, meaning it lacks the range to see that much, right? If you're asking for a thing and it's extreme and that is beyond current capability, then that is showing the limit of current capability, not necessarily the limit of truth. That's the way I look at it, is if I cannot, if I'm trapped in an either or choice and I don't understand what either of that means, I'm missing something. I'm asking the wrong question. I'm focused on a, there's a thing that exists that will make this question irrelevant. Is a better way to say that. And that's a great transition back into social algorithms because what you're doing when you interact with social algorithms is you become a variable in an equation that is clearly defined. It doesn't mean that you will see the equation. Most people do not. And nobody sees it right away because that's impossible because of the way information works. You can only find it in the moment. And there's a number of ways and techniques to do that. And everybody has a different skill set. Some people just naturally understand how to pick up the feel of a room, take that in and be what the room needs you to be. 
That's a body language skill. That's a subconscious skill. It's a very emotionally in tune skill. You just know how to make people be at ease or how to provide the feeling that is needed. And that's, that's just a part of some people. Other people, they, well, they learn it like I do and, or did anyways. Eventually you make it from one end to the other. That's, I also want to say that this is me a while ago. Found the feelings part of it, and it's, it's quite nice because it's a lot simpler in many ways um, to just be able to feel a thing and know that it's true rather than to have to, to play mental hopscotch for 10 years uh, every single time, even though you've done the experiment enough to trust the result. Um, so there's a way to understand these emotions where if I can figure out a few key positions there are equations out there that work every time. Like, for example, uh, I'll give you a, a simple example. This is social algorithms one. So I'm going to save the real heavy duty stuff um, for later. Um, social interaction 101. Okay. Let's say that two people are in a room and one of them doesn't understand human beings and they can only learn by mistake. So they don't know anything, but they can remember everything. And every time they screw up, the room changes and it resets and they get to try again. So they get infinite tries, but they're trapped until they get it right. So the goal is to have um, a successful social interaction where two people connect. That's the mission parameter. What the hell does that even mean? Now, the person doesn't know because they're trapped inside the the game they didn't write the game and if they knew what it meant they wouldn't be trapped in the game they'd be they'd be out of it they already won one try and they're done um that's what it's like to to go in a straight line and really be going in a circle you're trapped in the room you're trapped in the game you don't understand how it's a game it's just a reaction so successful social interaction where two people connect that's the goal and this person understands nothing about human beings and they remember everything that happens. They try again when they fail. Those are the rules of this game. It's kind of a miniature version of life, making friends, you know, being alive. But there's, it's a simple version just for, for analysis here, thought experiment. So the guy goes, God, you're ugly. And the situation resets. Okay, so he tried that. That person didn't respond well at all. So now he's in the room and uh, the, the room resets and he looks, looks at this person and he says, God, you're beautiful. And the guy gets pissed off even worse than when he got called ugly. And so the room resets. So now the guy's confused. Well, do I call him beautiful or do I call him ugly? And so what just happened? He did completely a thing that was irrelevant, tried to do the thing that was the opposite of that, and that was equally irrelevant. And so now he doesn't know what, what the heck's going on. When really his problem that he doesn't know yet, that maybe he'll figure out after the 500th question about physical appearance that makes this guy mad is, oh, it's not good to so start a social interaction with another man with a direct comment about their physical appearance. So he learns a different rule. And that rule now eliminates every other possible interaction uh, of that path because he understands the common thread that condenses all of those paths into a single more organized choice. So what he's done is he's expanded his free will because before he was trapped inside the view that it must be about appearance to now understanding it could be about appearance or it could not. Now there's an up and a down to this man now, because remember the first time he gets it wrong a lot. That's his weakness. He doesn't understand, but remember his strength is he remembers and he gets infinite tries. So now, not only has that person in that situation mapped the one rule 
that helps them separate comments about appearance from comments about appearance. And the second, and now he also has mapped that in 500 ways that somebody who just understood this was the wrong thing to do would not understand because they had a bigger step to get there. So their data is larger, but it's, it's, it's less dense. So now say that I'm interacting with this thing uh, and it's only understood comments about beauty. Maybe I recognize he's trapped in this pattern. And now I could be the angel or the devil in that situation. I could say, well, you know, you really aren't spending enough time talking about his nails. Guys are very self-conscious about their nails. Don't you, you should know that. And he would remember that. And if I'm an otherwise trustworthy individual, now how much deeper did that make that person's problem? Because to overcome their lack of, of truth, that is, that this has, this is a terrible idea and that it's only going wrong because you're doing it wrong. Um, that would multiply by his level of trust for me. And on top of that, he would have to admit uh, there was a betrayal. And on top of that, he would have to admit a gullible betrayal. It was his fault. At least part of it. I wasn't a good friend, but he was pretty dumb for a long time because of that. And after a while, I mean, how much of it is your fault and how much of it is theirs? Um, I digress, but that's the situation. Or I could be, I could be the angel on his shoulder and say, you know, it seems like every time we talk about that, he gets upset. I wonder if there's something else that would be worth talking about. And then maybe you change it to his outfit. Why? Because he's still stuck on appearance and he's going to be for a while. But if you can get it narrower and narrower and narrower, then maybe eventually after you run out of the shirt comments and the pant comments, and maybe it only takes 10 of those instead of 500, then you could get to the point and say, well, you know what? Maybe, maybe this is not it at all. What else could we try? And they trusted you for so long and you kind of led them in good directions that they thought would be good ideas. And you weren't a dick about it, so you developed enough trust so that finally when you say, well, why don't we look at this other thing? They'll actually say, yeah, why not? None of this is working. Rather than, well, what do you know about that anyways? I've been doing this for a long time. You don't understand what's going on because I live here. You're just visiting. Same person. Same circumstances. Conscious choices from an outside observer predictable outcomes. That's an algorithm. So one of the one of the, the, uh, the hardest parts about social algorithms is going to be, well, it's going to get tangled up in the ego. So if a person who is trying to use social algorithms, does not have a very clear map of their ego, they're going to fail. They're going to fail and they're going to bring suffering to themselves and suffering to the people they fail with. Uh, and they won't know why they're doing it because it's them. And the ego is the problem, which is why I'm saying the ego needs to be clearly measured because if it isn't, that's what's going to happen. So that's the if then of that situation. So when I say the ego needs to be properly understood, what, is, what does that mean? So in science, there's a term called uh, trying to, trying to isolated variables or something like that. It's about, it means when you do an experiment, you need to have everything the same except one isolated variable that changes. The reason they do that is that's how you can know what that specific variable does. If you change five things and then you run the experiment and you change five more things and something changes, well, you'll know that something is different, but you won't know which of those five things did it, only that those five of those things together uh, did that. 
Or you could run the experiment and change five things and the same thing happens. And you just got lucky because of how it works, different ratios of those things just so happen to give you the same result. But if you had mapped any other combination of those five changes, you would have gotten a different result and you would have been back in the problem of the first one. So um, isolating scientific things down to one variable is a very important concept when it comes to eliminating correlation without causation. And that's a phrase, that's a fancy philosophy phrase. And all of all that means is, is something happens and you believe and something happens after that. And you believe the two things are connected. Okay. Like if my phone rings and I answer my phone, that's correlation with causation. My phone rings and I answer it. That's an if, that's a then. This happens, that happens. If lightning strikes and I fart, that does not mean that lightning causes flatulence. That is correlation without causation. But here's what can happen in the mind of an incredibly twisted individual. They will learn to fart every time there's lightning. And no amount of telling them that lightning does not cause flatulence will ever convince them because they have created a perfect system that allows them to engineer a specific result every time, but they don't recognize that they are the source of the output. That's correlation without causation, uh, combined with confirmation bias, combined with uh, fear of whatever, right? That's, it's called an ad hoc argument where it just builds and builds until it becomes invincible, uh, which is a different way of saying, because I said so, but I don't have enough ego inside myself to say because I said so. So I'm going to pile all of these other words on it that make it look smarter than it is, when really it's just a projection of this is how I want it, damn it, and you are not going to change my mind, period. So that's got to get under control if you're going to use social algorithms. And that's a good thing. It's a good thing because you can do a lot of damage with these. And some of the simple ones that I've seen in the world are used for damage. The media, the news, they, they hurt people. People hurt people. Why? Because they know how. That's a social algorithm. I know if I say this thing to you, it's gonna hurt your feelings. That's a social algorithm. The news says, uh, if I say the word pandemic X amount of times in a 30 minute period, that translates to an uptick of sales and medical gear by X amount of percent, which they can track. So Big Daddy, whomever writes the checks, probably a pharmaceutical company, because I can pick on them because all of them do it. Um, then all of a sudden, maybe the word Sniffles gets added to, and I'm making up an example, but these are very real examples you could find. Um, if I mention this danger in this specific wording, it's been shown that there will be an uptick in research of this specific type of medicine. And because I am spending money on advertising to be put at the top of any searches related to that specific phrase, which has now just been released into the public, that will translate into a number of preventative sales for whatever it is they were, they were trying to sell. That is a premeditated social algorithm to engineer a need for a product and then have that need be filled by having the right messages put in the right places with the right presentation. And that's how elections work. That's how our laws get made. That's, that's how a lot of stuff works, really. It's fear, manipulation, control. So social algorithms are out there and they're in use. And it's probably why people have such a poor view of them, in my opinion, because they only see the ones that are terrible. So anytime I try to bring up the good side of this, the powers for good, the ways that you can make evil defeat itself instead of defeating what's around it, uh, the ways to build stability and happiness reliably, those are the things that need to exist for people who currently have a dim view of 
of any sort of social interaction being able to predictably produce another type of social interaction. An idea is not a dirty idea. It can be abused in ways that make the behavior obviously dirty, but the behavior is not the people who decided to use it that way. The people are the people who decided to use it that way. And they understand enough to be dangerous. It's power. It is social power. That is the social algorithm. There's a hierarchy of social order. Some people are trapped in the bottom. Most people are trapped in the bottom for nobodies. They might even have a few thousand people who listen to them here and there, but they don't matter in terms of what actually happens in the world. They, they don't make the decisions about foreign policy. They don't make the decisions about trade or war. They don't develop new products. They don't develop new marketing campaigns. They don't develop uh, who is going to be in movies, who's going to be seen on television. They don't influence who's elected, tell you that much. The people who are elected influence who is elected. Uh, and anyone who says otherwise is a part of that machine and they won't thank you for it because that would make the machine break. They need you to be angry. So you're not going to get anything from anybody, least of all me. I think you're still in the hamster wheel. Um, anyways, so that's the, the downside of social algorithms is power. But what happens when people who don't trust themselves find power, but they're also good people? Well, they'll just avoid the whole damn situation. Now, I'm not going to get mixed up in that. It could go bad. I don't want to, no, no, that's going to end poorly. Best to avoid the situation altogether. That's a bad thing to get mixed up in. It can only end poorly. Well, that person is doing a bunch of things there. Number one is they're admitting their limitation, which if they're being honest about their limitation, it's the smartest thing they can do. And if they recognize that that limitation honestly would destroy them in that situation or that they could only make it worse, then it's wise for them to stay away. Now, if that person doesn't understand anything about themselves and they just say every situation that looks like this is a bad situation and so I'm going to avoid it, they're taking the right action, but they're going in the wrong direction with it. So there's only one point that they understand. This is a bad idea. They don't understand how or why. Not like the first person does. That's what everything in this lecture is about. The social algorithm is understanding your place and the hierarchy of how is what is happening, happening on a mathematical level. And whoever has the better math wins because math is what predicts the future. All right, so I'll just go ahead and chime in and say, since it feels like a good moment to, um, a few similarities. Yeah, go ahead. Um, all right, so half of what you say is like, yeah, everybody works like that to some level. And then the other half is, why would anyone need to work like that? <laughs> So it's not what it's not a, it's not a why it's a what you can do with it. Yeah, yeah no, no, no. I, I, I'm just I'm just uh, explaining commonalities. Maybe I didn't understand the commonality. It sounded like a question to me. So, repeat your no, last. Sentence. The commonality like was in. The commonality was in. Um, oh, oh, oh! You're saying what separates people is there are some who ask why and some who don't who say why why would I ask that. Yeah, like the information is, you know, logically based, you know, like I usually tell you I can follow everything, you know, Yeah. Um, but um, the way I'm filtering it or the parts that I agree with or the way I'm, you know, the way our dance will work. Yeah. Stop. 
So, so um, social algorithms, we have that. We have the 50-50. That's usually the first split where things usually come in. And then after that, I see... So let's talk Social about engineering. That. That's yeah. what I shared with you. Yeah. Social yeah. engineering. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Ooh. Yes, it's, it's, it's a form of social engineering. I'm cooking with jalapenos and the smoke got in my chest a little bit. That's okay. Ooh. It's the hot stuff right now. That's all. I like too. But um, but yeah, I think I'm following along. That's a little bit, you know, just the okay. connection points yeah. and axes and things like that yeah. to give you. So I'll go, I'll go into that a little bit more because it's a good question. Uh, and it's actually the next part of the, the lecture is, okay, so you want to do a social algorithm. Well, you can't do one until you know how they work. So they share a, a basic construction. They all do. So the, the, you can build on that construction, but the parts are always the same. And any social algorithm you learn that you test it, becomes a usable part inside other social algorithms. You can chain things together, which means if you can recognize a situation where an output uh, is guaranteed, you also have a situation where if you have another situation where the output of that is the output of the first social algorithm that you figured out, now you've created a chain. So once you have one, you can string them together, which means it's possible to create paths through a person's own mental space. So there are things that you can do with that. And I'll talk about what some of those things are, but I want to preface it with saying that a person will always have final choice over their actions, but they will not always have final choice over what they understand. So certain situations are beyond a person's ability to control in the social setting. That's why some people have more charisma than others. That's how we measure that. Um, your popularity at school. It's your position in the social hierarchy. And if you want to talk about, if I'm talking about social hierarchies, I have to throw a shout out to Dr. Jordan Peterson, um, who spent a lot of time teaching me about what the social hierarchy was and how it interacts with our brain. More or less, we're good at knowing if we're on top or we're on the bottom. And if we're on the bottom, we get stress hormones that make us less likely to fight. Why? Because if we fight and we're on the bottom, we're going to lose. Why? Because we're on the bottom. Okay. That's where it ends. But you're on the top. Well, what does that mean? Well, I'm on top. I can do anything. You're going to fight every time. You're probably going to win too. Good share of it. And then the only thing that could happen at that point is you forget that you have to fight. You forget how to fight. And then you lose your spot on top because people who know how to fight come and take it over. So that's kind of a social hierarchy situation. Um, the minute you stop understanding that you're in the game and just assuming the game belongs to you, it's when the game beats you. Uh, and he, he uses lobsters as an example. Uh, when the lobsters are on top, they have high dopamine, serotonin. They're like, yeah, I can do anything. I'm the best lobster. Um, so anyways, that's how a social hierarchy kind of functions. So when I'm talking about social hierarchies and uh, like as a concept, that was kind of how I got to understand the way that those chemicals work and how they interact with us on a deeper level. Okay, we interact with a thing and when we hit the limits of our understanding, our brain gives us chemicals to make us stop. That's a very clear way to sum up a lot of feelings. Okay. If you hit the limits of your understanding and you need to keep going, your brain will give you a chemical to get you to stop. And it doesn't care how. It will bribe you with serotonin and dopamine. Uh, it will punish you with cortisol. 
Uh, it will paralyze you with depression and anxiety. It will give you euphoria. It will give you inner peace. It will give you happiness and bliss. As long as you stop asking damn questions that you aren't supposed to understand. That's the feelings part of it. That's the, that's the survival mechanism. That's the not right now part of your body. So that moment that you experience that isn't your final state. That's like a save point in a video game. Something important just happened. And you can try to live in that moment of importance forever, or you can recognize that your feeling is the signal that something important happened and try to understand what that signal was. And here's the crazy thing. When you understand what the signal means, the feeling goes away and it's replaced by a different one that's interested in something else. Which is a scary thing for people who experience emotion because in some cases, emotion can be replaced by understanding. And if one doesn't fully map the benefits of that understanding, to realize that that understanding has an emotional boundary, which they're capable of understanding, then what is a, at first a loss of sensation turns into an expansion of perception with full sensation. Man, I go through it. And so for, for these more emotionally in tune people, that can be a very difficult journey because if they trust their emotions to the point where they won't listen to their logic because of them, they're never going to have the logic to figure out that they need to doubt themselves in very specific situations if they want the most optimal outcome to happen. And that's a lot easier than coming from the, that's a lot harder than coming from the ground up and piecing together with bits and pieces that, man, I can understand it this way, but it would be nice if I could just feel like that. So the journey up is slow and it sucks at the beginning so bad that a person will feel like dirt. And a lot of people die in the dirt because of it, because it's a lot of work to get out of it. A lot of hard questions. It's a lot of understanding things that, that aren't going to feel right. And there's no choice in the beginning. And that's why some people make it because their survival instinct is so strong that they'll, they'll fight anything to stay alive, even if it's the worst of themselves. And anyone who can't fight that, well, they're, gonna, they're, gonna, they're not gonna fight it. They're gonna be killed by it. It's gonna fill their life with resentment and hate. They're gonna be self-destructive and they're gonna take people down around them. And they, their own ability to make themselves the hero of their story will stretch the limits of credulity so much that they won't even be able to lie to themselves anymore. And they'll be miserable anytime someone reminds them of that in ways that are increasingly obvious to anyone but them. They'll die alone. And if you talk to them, they wouldn't have it any other way. Why? Well, because everything they know sucks and why would they want more of it? So they got to learn there's another way first and then they got to believe it. And then they got to believe that, that they're capable of understanding it. That's the pain at the beginning. That cost is paid up front. I could be more because I'm nothing. person pays that cost first and they pay it early enough there's no limit to what they can learn because i am nothing is not a diminishment of, of potential that exists it's a recognition of potential that could happen it's not how small am i is it it's how big can i grow what do i need to start doing that so in both situations, you, you stay the same size at that moment. There's a snapshot measurement of what you are, and it's a number, and you can pick what that number is and what it means, but it's that number. And one perspective says this number won't get any smaller. 
no. And the next perspective says, how much bigger could this number get? And those are two very different paths. You pick the one you think is gonna, gonna make you into something that you wanna be. That's all I have to say about that. But the point is, there's a, there's a journey through the mind when it comes to social algorithms. And they're all tied to fight and flight, fight, flight, feeding, and mating. So let me give a, a simple social algorithm as an example, something that I would use. Okay, this is a very simple one. This is the test of balance. It's the first thing I do in any social interaction. And the reason I do that is because for any social interaction to work, at least in a predictable way, is to understand what social interaction you are inside. It's a combination lock. What exactly is happening here? And that combination lock is built of two things, what you understand and what the person understands that's talking to you. And two people can have very similar ways of thinking and those similarities could be very large. And two people could have very different ways of thinking and those uh, similarities could be very small. But unless what those similarities and differences are exist as a concept, for one of those two people, then the interaction those two people have is going to be completely predictable from an outward perspective. Meaning this person and that person, when they meet for the first time and have this conversation, this will always happen. Every time. Why? Because neither one of them knows that they're making choices. They're just acting in the moment. What do you mean, what do I say when this happens? What do you mean there's a choice? Like that person made me, whatever. There's no choice there, it's easy. Okay, it's easy, you're right. Easy enough that someone else who can figure out a little more can, can rely on it. They can also rely on your faith and how easy it is. And use that as a stable point of knowledge. That's a reliable thing in an uncertain world and you gave it to them. That gives them power if they know which parts of you don't move. So that is the key to a successful social algorithm. You need to find parts that don't move. Why? Because then you have something to anchor to. You have a position. And now we get, so that's, that's the first thing. That's the concept. Here's how you chase it. The test of balance, the first social algorithm I learned. Somebody talks to me uh, and they give me, well, uh, why don't we do this through interaction? Um, give me an opening comment that you would say to a person for the first time if you were trying to be their friend. Just something for me to dissect. Hi, how are you doing today? Okay. So now I hear that phrase. Hi, how are you doing today? That's the beginning of a social algorithm to me. I don't know what social algorithm it is. I don't know this person. I don't know anything about them, except they said, hi, how are you doing today? That was six words for a greeting. As far as greetings go, that greeting was a little bit longer than average. So that means that it's likely, number one, this person is paying attention to this interaction with some level of passion. And number two, this person, has a lot to say sometimes because of that. Now that's all I understand. And I don't know if I'm right, but I have a guess. I have one equation, one variable. I need to test, is this person excited um, or are they not? So now I've broken it down into a choice because I've analyzed the situation and given myself a stable metric that I can add. So now let's say that I assume this person is not excited. Um, and maybe that's because I'm not excited. And I just see that in them because that's what I, what I do. But so I would respond. So all this person understands is that they've said, hi, how are you doing today? I would say, oh, just one of those days that, that really wears you down. No, I have a hard time finding something to do. But you don't need to hear about my problems. Uh, I'm doing fine. How are you? 
That would be my response. So that's a carefully constructed moment of uncertainty. And that's the technique of social algorithms. You cannot influence the interaction before you know what you're interacting with or you will get unpredictable results. So what you do is you replace a moment of uncertainty, your own or theirs, with an equal moment of uncertainty that seems relevant and see what they do with it. So it's like hot potato. Whoever gets stuck with the potato gives away their position. And so if I said that, Tony, but you didn't know me or anything about me or that I understand stuff like this, I just unloaded all of that on you and said, I really don't know what to do about it. What would your response be? It would likely depend on the context. No, like that, that is the context. Like, just met for the first time. Where? You have said six words to me and I said that in response and that's all you know. It depends on where. Because they of were just talking church? in a room, like a building, we're waiting in line. <laughs> it's all about context. I see, okay, because I'm all about people. We're at the bank. The, way, the bank, there we go. Um, Standing in line, there's not enough tellers. Hi, how are you doing today? I would give something empathetic, but not enough to try to get them to talk. No, no, no you just role play it out. Just be like. Yeah, yeah. I'd be like, um, man, that sucks. Sorry to hear. Yeah. So now, but I wouldn't ask anything about it because I don't want to know anything about it. <laughs> so now what I've gathered in this situation, at least from this context, I don't know anything about this person as an individual, but that person has just told me, you're right. I'm not interested in your problem because of their response. It was non-committal. It was wishy-washy. And it really kind of was like, who are you and what are you doing here? So what I would recognize is I read the situation wrong. Meaning, I acted as though he was not excited, and he was not happy about that. He did not connect with that. There was no resonance. So that would be my certainty point. So then I would say, then I would recognize, okay, I need to change tactics. And he says this to me. And uh, so now my third interaction, and this is the only words that were shared out loud are the words that have been understood if I was in that situation and my goal was to connect with this man for some reason, and he doesn't know that's my goal, um, I would just say, you know what? That's really not fair of me. I, I shouldn't take my crap out on you. Look, my name's Tom. I had a rough day. I'm sorry for introducing myself that way. What's your name, sir? So then I would take the opposite approach. And, and I, you don't have to go down this chain forever to kind of see how this position how this thing can work. You can test it with anything. Is a person mad about a specific issue or do they not have an opinion? That's good to know too. Where somebody is uncertain is actually the most useful places a person can be because when you reach a social algorithm, the goal of a successful social algorithm or one that works is to reach a point of certainty for you, which is a point of uncertainty for the person you're interacting with. And that happens whether people are perceptive of it or not. I just wanna make that clear. This is not a thing that somebody invents. This is a math system that exists that people behave by and the people who recognize the pattern just are aware of it. And there's different ways to be aware of it. Some people say, I can spot a liar. I just know that person's not trustworthy by the way they walk. And maybe you're right. Why? Because you're very much in tune with how people explain themselves through their body language. You're very in tune with how people explain themselves through their, uh, through their speech patterns. All of those are just being very in tune with certain types of social algorithms. And it doesn't make a person evil or good to have that awareness. It just is. And that there are different levels of it is what determines social hierarchies in general. All I'm saying is that it's possible to learn these things so that you don't get stuck on the bottom. Because if you care enough to sit through lectures like this, to learn how to understand your own mind more because you're uncertain and you wanna do the right thing, it's a good chance you're gonna do something good with this knowledge. And if you're out there to make a buck quick and take advantage of people, you're not gonna to wanna to put the time in that has to answer all these hard questions that don't really have anything to do with me while I sit through all of this, which make a person question to their very core 
are they aware of all the choices they're making and are they making the ones that are going to be good for them or are they just wasting their lives waiting to die? <coughs> Thank you. So this is really about strength of awareness. And it's, it's a straight arm wrestling match if you wanted to put a, uh, an analogy to social algorithm. Whoever has the stronger awareness can do more. Like if, like, let's say for example, uh, and I'm gonna use a person that's imaginary. Let's say, say for example that uh, I'm living my life and this person who really doesn't have this shit together comes to me and they want me to take over something for them that I really don't want anything to do with. I don't hate that person. I don't want to hurt their feelings. I really don't want to be caught up in their shit. And I know that if I just say no, it's going to end poorly. So what would I do in that situation? My goal is to avoid taking responses. So first thing I have to do is set a goal. We talked about this in other, uh, other lectures. You need a goal to balance the equation. The goal is the answer, okay? So if you don't have a very specific answer, you won't be able to find the specific equation that matches it. That makes sense. You need to have your goal in sight. So the first thing you do, if you're creating a situation and analyzing it rather than reacting to it, you don't need a goal if you're reacting. I'll make that very clear. You don't need a goal to be reactive. You just need to be to be reactive. Amoebas are reactive. You poke them and they, they, they swim away. All right, that's not awareness. That's, that's reaction. Don't come after my amoeba, okay? <laughs> I love amoeba. Don't you use them as an example of not being as amazing as potentially infinitely possible. Right, look, all of that might be true. All I'm saying is that if I ever have beef with you in the future and I need a distraction, all I got to do is talk shit about Amoeba. So thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> that would be a different kind of social interaction. That would be the grind my gears of a social algorithm. Um, some, uh, but anyways, um, this imaginary person, this imaginary person, I don't want to get caught up in their shit, but my goal is to let them be responsible for what they need to be responsible for. And for me to get to still be their friend, because maybe I, in the future, it'll be better. And I don't want to cut them out of my life. I just don't want any part of that. There's a number of ways that I could do that. One is I could be a sufficiently talented therapist to analyze their problems, give them practical advice in language they could understand, which breaks down their problem into small mappable steps that I can understand, which will get them reliably from point A to point B, with transitions between each step that are small enough to fit inside their unique personal tolerance. If I love somebody, that's what I'll do for them. If I see somebody has something that I view is a dark spot on their map and I see it holding them back in ways that they cannot understand, and I love that person, I will put in the soul crushing work of interacting with them in ways that will take them to that point. Because every time it happens, they love me more for it. Because at that point is the good thing that I found when I went there. And that's my goal every time when I love somebody. That's the work I'll put in. For me, it's because it's fun. Yeah. Like, I think you've read my love post before. The way I put it is, when you love somebody, you personally develop their problems and then try to work through it with them, not for them, yeah. not force them, you give but them the try. You give exactly. them the path and the courage to try. That's all you can do. Uh, and depending on who you're talking to, that map is very different. No two maps look alike, uh, but there are common roads. Uh, there's a few recognizable landmarks that if you can get a person there it's usually smooth sailing for the rest of it it's usually the stuff way out of the edges that you gotta that you gotta watch out for but that's more the advanced social algorithms part so i'm just going to talk about the main roads right now with the last 22 minutes left 
So let's talk about some of the main roads. I've got this person and say that was my first approach, okay? I want to grow them in a way that they will outgrow their problem because that's easier for me and is a more permanent solution and a better solution for everybody involved. Now, if I'm wrong about that, I'll make that person's life worse and shame on them for putting me in charge of their life and shame on me for not recognizing how to do it better. But that's a different thing. Let's assume that in this situation, you're helping someone with a problem that's relatively simple for you. And maybe they just have a thick head when it comes to one specific simple thing. Keep it vague enough that that matters. So this isn't an impossible situation, okay? I'm not trying to, to, to create peace in the Middle East. Maybe this person just has a hard time leaving the house. And their goal is to make it to the mailbox. And that's what I can give to them. And it will make their life so much better if they can have that. Because from their perspective, the difference between going from your uh, door to going to your mailbox actually increases the size of your world by 100%. Um, so yeah, for them, it's a big deal. So it's not about how big of a deal it is for you. It's about how big of a deal it is for the person that you care about, which if you're smart with your time and you're wise with your perception, you will limit the things you do to the things that are easy for you and would require the least amount of steps for this person. It's possible to take a person from one end of the mental spectrum all the way to the other if you got 10 years. And you know exactly what you're doing and you never screw up bad enough to make them hate you. And I'll tell you what, that would be a feat of social gymnastics, the likes of which nobody has probably ever seen, but it's possible. It's possible if you understand the full picture that well, that you could literally take someone up the court and down the other. And if we're looking at other things, that's possible for some very special individuals. Michael Jordan. Remember Remember, one of my mottos is we are only limited by our patience and creativity. Yeah. One of my kind of best friends um, uh, had a huge Confederate flag and BLM problems, and we were debating for three years about it. Okay. But in my mind, it was a debate for the rest of our lives because it's not a, you know, that's, that's just how it is because we're only limited by our patience and our creativity. That's the yeah, he's, uh, he's actually one of my business partners. One of my good, good, professional, knowledgeable, I can call him for anything, business partners. Did you guys, uh, where did you guys, are you comfortable sharing where you landed on the whole thing? If it went on he doesn't fly long? his flag anymore. He understands that the symbol itself, uh, it doesn't matter how he feels about it, but the fact that society feels a certain way about it, it doesn't matter as much his own personal perspective, but rather whatever he is trying to say is not being said. Okay. And so he decided that. Um, Does he still keep it probably in his house? Yeah, I like I don't think he threw it out. It's not a disdainful thing. That's what I meant. Um, white yeah. guilt. White guilt is something that we talked about a whole lot. And um, while I do believe there's a place for it, there's not a place for any negative emotion other than to promote positive change. Other so, yeah, it's, it's the wake up call. It's not the, the goal. Exactly. So, so sure, you might feel guilty about something someone else did. Now, let's not feel guilty anymore because we're going to do something, you know? So right. I don't think he threw it away. I think he still has every ounce of pride that he ever did, you know? Yeah. And I never tried to take that from him. But um, he understood my perspective, and he also understood a lot of other people's perspective, you know? He understood the. I actually went through those three years of teaching him the perspectives of how history was written, because yeah. to him there there wasn't ever a question of another narrative. What's the worst thing you can do to a to a a, a specific belief? Would you think if you had to pick one, like say you're in control, of, say you have the ability to influence public opinion okay? <laughs> by creating messages, you can create whatever message you want. Um, what would be the worst thing you could do to use that power? Say somebody else has an opinion you don't like. What would be the worst thing you could use your power for to do to that opinion? What would you What would you do to make that opinion suffer? Well, see, the worst thing that you could do has to be specific to that person. Because worst, and in that context, it's all about retribution or vengeance or attacking or things like that. However, if we're talking about hurting the public, yeah. um, the worst thing you could do away. would be to halfway wake everybody up. Because that's how I think that the power stays in power. 
you just give those under your control a little bit more power every now and then, and they'll think they're making progress. But let me let me talk to you about a different kind of social algorithms. And this one goes a little bit, uh, this is more social algorithms too, where I'm going to talk about the way social algorithms are constructed around our society and where we see them. That's going to be social algorithms too. Um, but I'm going to give you a secret. Um, and this is uh, people who have known me for a long time will always hear me say this at one point or another. I asked the question, what's the biggest con when it comes to playing the shell game? So that's the setup, and there's a response to that. But first, I'll explain what the shell game is. People don't understand it. So you're on the beach, or you're walking down the boardwalk, or I don't know, in the city, or wherever. You got a guy, guy with a table, and he's got three cups, or three walnuts, or three shells, or whatever. And underneath one of them is a ball. And he says, all right, if you find the ball, you get the money. And if, if you don't find the ball, I keep your money. And he gets you to play. And maybe you win some, you lose some. But at the end of the day, it seems like that guy who had the game did better than you. Okay, yeah, when some lose, some walk away. What's the biggest con for the shell game? Well, it's got nothing to do with the game. It's getting a person to play the shell game. That is the, the biggest con of the shell game. Once you have engagement, that is when control is possible. So if an idea is interacted with in any way that produces a predictable outcome, it becomes an idea that controls the person who picks which outcome it should have. So let's talk about, uh, let's talk about the gun debate. I'm not gonna go into specifics about which side is right because I think they're both idiots. Uh, they're both motivated by fear, and neither one of them balances themselves in ways that are useful, and that's by design. Having said that, why is the gun debate a debate at all? It's a debate because people have found out that you can get people to make a decision based on it easily. They will reduce a complex topic to a simple answer. Either I, I want more guns or I don't want more guns. Okay. That's not how people have the conversation in their everyday lives, but that's how they vote. The people who direct that policy, they don't care why you press the button for them. They care that you press the button for them. That's the goal, right? Their goal isn't to have everybody agree with them in the specific, most specific way possible because anyone who understands human beings at all recognizes that's impossible. And collecting votes like that would take more time than there is in the universe to win any kind of election. So no, you find things that you can talk about that will make people do what you want. That's social algorithms too. Um, but anytime someone makes a decision, yes or no, the con is not the decision that is made. The con is thinking you have to make a decision. The con is being in the game. If I say X, then you have to vote Y. Why not? Why? Because if you don't, everything you care about will be destroyed. Fuck you. I'm not going to vote for you for that. But guess what? Maybe that person works for the other side. And they knew that if they went around being an asshole in the name of one candidate, they'd be turning other candidates against them. That's a social algorithm. Why is it easy? Because it's easy to believe people are being mean. Especially when they act a certain way. So a person acts that certain way and you believe what you see, that person has control over you now, even though you're the hero and they're the villain. Well, guess what? The hero and the villain always tell the same story. The hero beats the villain. So if someone says, I'm going to pretend to be the villain because I want you to beat me, which will make you do this and think that, they don't have a limitation on pride when it comes to an algorithm. You're the hero. They're providing ones and zeros for you to interact with. They gave you a monster because they knew you'd fight it. If you really want to get deep into what a social algorithm is, it's understanding where monsters come from in people's minds. 
because people run from monsters. Let's talk about that friend that I had again, a guy who wants me to take over his shit. I really don't want him out of my life, but I really don't want anything to do with him. And I, I don't have the patience to give this guy therapy because I think that would take me a hundred years and he'd be lost cause as far as that's concerned. But he's fine to go have a beer with, you know, every now and again, because his life doesn't totally implode. It just, it would destabilize mine if I was any more involved with him than I was. Let's say all that's true and I still like this person. Well, I know a lot of people like that, I'm sure you do too. And I know this person has severe death anxiety. I don't have to talk about what they care about at all. I could just say, you know, man, I've been thinking a lot about it lately. And all these people in my family got cancer. And I just watched them become less and less of themselves until they died. And, and then I had to look at the funeral and everybody was crying. And that would have been better if there was more than 15 people there. And that was somebody I didn't even know and it made me feel that way. So what am I going to do when it comes to be my time to go? Well, this person has severe death anxiety and that's all I've been talking about for the last minute. They're not going to care about their problem and what I have to do with it if I'm going to be talking about something they're scared of the whole time. They're going to run. Well, that's the simplest version. You say run. They're not going to drop everything they're doing, uh, put their hands to their mouths and skitter away like some sort of cockroach. But they are going to make up an excuse to leave. They are going to let you off the hook and not mention it again. And they say, you know what? No, don't worry about it. I got it. And then they're going to leave. Why? Because they get to be away from you. So what did I do? I just had a bad moment in their eyes. You know, I was going through some crap and you can understand why I was going through that crap because you can't even think about that stuff, that invisible hypothetical friend that I have. So when I say after this person's problem is gone, man, sorry about that. I don't know where I was coming from. They're going to immediately latch on to that because what you've just told them is I'm not going to talk about that anymore. At least not for a while. And everything that we used to have, we can have that again. And it's not going to be any different because I said I was wrong. So I apologize for the anxiety that I created. If I'm a if I'm if I'm a mediocre friend, I won't point out to the person that that's exactly what happened, and they let it happen. If I'm a good friend, I'll point that out to them and say, "Look, I love you and I care about you, and you really do need to get your shit in order." And I didn't want to deal with it, and you weren't ready to hear that at the time. But because I love you enough that it's worth it. I'm going to show you exactly what happened and exactly what you did and why you did it so that if you're strong enough to understand what just happened, you could also recognize you're strong enough to change it because that's the same thing. If you can recognize a thing, you can change a thing. It requires the same amount of strength. The only thing that is failing is, is a lack of faith in that ability. And that's a personal failing. That's not a universe failing. If you can recognize a thing, you can change it, period. That's, that's, a, that's a rule. That's, that's one of the core rules of social algorithms, which means the more you can recognize, the more you can change, which means if you try to recognize the parts of yourself that are holding you back, guess what? You can change that. But what do you have to do? You have to look at the parts of yourself that need to change. Well, why would you want to change them? Because they're great? Well, that doesn't make any sense. Does that mean everything's great? No. If it did, you wouldn't be wasting your time listening to stuff like this, and I wouldn't be wasting my time trying to figure it out. You do it because it helps. So, if you can recognize it, you can change it. That's the heart of the social algorithm. Can you recognize a thing someone else cannot? Can you tie that to things they can recognize? Do they always make the same choice every time when you reach a certain point? If any of those things are true, there's a social algorithm there that can be built. And that's just a different way of saying there is a very specific perspective of interaction that will lead to a very specific place which is a different way of saying everybody has choices that they can make. 
And as long as people recognize they have the same choice at the same time, then they can make a choice together. And guess what? Now you have two things which are in the same place at the same time on the same wavelength, moving in the same direction. That is power because you've doubled your potential. Why? Because you put the time in to match what you see to what you believe. And it was not an exercise of exclusion. It was an exercise of inclusion, of addition. No either or. No if but. Always yes and. That is the mechanism of the social algorithm. What yes and. What combination, what addition, what, what direct interaction will steer this a certain way? Um, say that I've got a person who is really down on themselves and they're just a self-deprecator, okay? And they've got a big moment coming up and they just, they're, they're stuck in their own head. What am I gonna do to that person? Am I gonna walk up to them and give them the you're a special guy speech where you can do anything you put your mind to and oh yeah, if you just try a little harder, the sun will always come up tomorrow. If I do that and say I mean that and say I'm really good at that kind of speech and I give that speech to that person, is that gonna help them? No, they don't understand the world that way. They don't, they're, they're showing me they don't understand the world that way. They're, they're, they're screaming it. They think the world is out to get them. They think that uh, they've got all these enemies everywhere and all these problems. And guess what? Because they think that that's how they understand the world, they do. They've got these very real obstacles. And the only way they know how to, how to handle them is just to have them hit their face over and over again. So that person, I'm looking at that person and I want to write an algorithm because my goal is to make that person more, more cheerful, more empowered. I want to give that person some courage to go out there and if I can't stop him from getting hit, at least I can make him feel a couple of them less hard, you know, give him a moment of goddamn peace where maybe he can ask himself, you know, maybe this ain't so bad. I like how that was. Maybe I could do that again. But that person isn't there. That person wants to go there. They're currently in this depressed, self-depreciating, self-hating state. So... If I know this person, the right answer might be to, to give them a self-deprecating speech and be like, all right, listen, we both know that most days you're a sack of shit, but that's not today. All right. Look, you fucked it up a thousand times and you paid for it and that's with you. And then nobody's going to say that didn't happen. But guess what? You weren't sleeping while that happened either. And you learned a few things and you're a tough son of a bitch. So why don't you go out there, pull yourself together, I don't know, drink a Red Bull or some shit, and, and just do what you know you have to do. Just get out there and fight. That's what I'm going to tell that person. And if I tell that same speech to the wrong person, the person who is sensitive, needs encouragement, needs emotional, and I open with you sack of shit, they're going to die before I get past that sentence. But guess what? What destroyed one person is what woke another person up. So any kind of social algorithm, you have to recognize it's not, is this situation good or bad? That is, you know what? I'm gonna break my own rule. That is a stupid way to think. Is this situation good or bad? Stupid, stop it. You're hurting yourself and here's why. I'm gonna back that up. That's a big claim, so I need a big, back up to that. If you think that a situation is always good or always bad, you are leaving two thirds of the information on the table at any given time, period. Because any situation has a path where it could be an improvement over something that already is. So sometimes the path out of hell looks like parts of hell. So if you were to say this type of language, say, say for example, I had a, a person who was sensitive to language, listen to that motivational speech I gave to that person who, who was self-deprecating. They would say, you should never talk to somebody like that. You don't understand the harm you're doing. 
that person does not understand the power for good that that type of speech can have. And what happens is when they work against that situation in all situations, they also work against the potential for good inside that situation, potential for good that exists. So they become a hero in their own mind who has actually become the villain to something that's legitimately good. And we all do that. Every last one of us. And here's how we do it. We make that decision. This is always good. This is always bad. It's fine to have a rule about certain kinds of situations. Generally, it doesn't turn out too well when this type of thing happens. But that is different from the existence of a hypothetical counterpart. You need to know what that looks like. If you're going to understand what your position means. Because a lot of times there exists very real information in the counterpart of a thing that helps you define the behavior of the part that you do understand. There's a direct link. That's one third of the two thirds of the information that's being left on the table. The other third of that is what do these two things have in common and what's their relationship to each other? So if you think a situation is good or bad all the time, you're missing the hypothetical counterpart and the information that you could have if you understood that concept as a whole. And recognize that's what the test of balance is for, by the way, in social algorithms. That's why it's the first test. What does this person think is good and what do they think is bad? They tell me what their limits are because I ask. Or I, I provide an ambiguous response and ask for a choice. And you need limits to understand things. And that's why understanding is limited, at least after the first try. You can slowly map understanding in ways that explain everything. But that, I think, if you take one thing with you, the lesson of social algorithms one, uh, and you wanted to practice this as homework, uh, I would introduce you to the concept of uh, the test of balance, as it were. Find out where a person fits on an idea. That's a stable point. And we do this, there's ways to do this, which are easy. The beginner version is to go to groups where things are already decided for you. This is the Star Trek fan club. All right, a bunch of people have decided Star Trek is good and they got together. I think it's pretty safe that if I go here and assume Star Trek is good, I can interact with these people reliably under that assumption. And I can start doing things that assume the people I'm talking to will think Star Trek is good. And then I can test the responses I get. Then you can start to map your own patterns. And it's very simple. You have one side of the test of balance where it's always on the same stage and you can explore that to your heart's content with no negative repercussion uh, unless you're out there looking for a pipe. I wonder what happens if I say Star Trek is bad. Well, you can explore that too. You can say Captain Kirk was a punk and see where that gets you. Uh, the, the, so you can map everything with one piece of information. So that's the simplest, safest version. Go somewhere where the people have these little internet chats. Try to make good chats. I'm not going to tell you to go pick fights, but I can't stop some of you from doing that because you can map it. There is. We did a whole lecture on mental martial arts. So yes, you can map the fighting of how people fight with their ideas and very much it's different social algorithms mental martial arts is different social algorithms but uh yeah tony go ahead uh, you can have really the last comment and the last question if you want because i just finished well i think you just gave like a caution or a recommendation but um and so i wanted to give a recommendation um because something that really helped me navigate the medium of online and people was that I worked at an information desk my freshman summer of college. Okay. That meant I had eight hour shifts to debate online. <laughs> I thought you were gonna give me some wisdom that you learned by giving out information. Nope, all I was gonna say was, um, all energy is useful is one of my slogans, but I wasn't even going there. I was just saying, when you decide to uh, engage groups online, 
with the purpose of them being against you or uh, things like that to make sure that you're really there to learn. Because if, you know, that's the real goal, then that's the best thing to do. And that's what I do. You know, I joined Trump groups. I joined white supremacy groups. I joined, you know, those people. And they all have valid perspectives from their perspectives. Yeah. Yeah, if you're if you're reacting, you're probably not learning. It's hard to do both at the same time. Uh, if you're wise, you will react, stop whatever you're doing, and try to learn until you figure out what that reaction means. Then you'll proceed. Uh, but anyways, that's what I've got on social algorithms one. That was the very basics of it. Uh, social algorithms two will be a little bit later, and then that's going to cover systems of social control and how certain ideas. Uh, certain political structures engineer predictable human behavior in ways that create a stable system of government. So that's not to say that it's it's all bad. You know, we're not shitting in holes. We get two day delivery on, on an air conditioner or or, or a fucking uh, drinking bird or a solar panel that charges your phone. You know, there's there's not a, we have running water. We have we have trash pickup in supermarkets and so. I just want to point out that all of that is included inside the concept of, of the social algorithms too, where giant systems are used to herd people in predictable directions. So do not think for one second that I'm not also saying that you animals wouldn't tear this thing apart uh, in very predictable ways without these very predictable systems of control to exist. Um, so it's, it's less about tearing it down and more about understanding it in ways that can, yes, and take the good parts and add to the parts uh, that protect us from the things that would destroy all the stuff we want to keep around. Uh, Tony, you got your hand up. Comment on the preview. So that's pretty good. I think that was old. I'm sorry. Oh, <laughs> here, I was feeling impressed. Like, I was like, wow, my teaser was so hard that he had a question that couldn't wait. All right. Now, we're going to end on that because that's a funny joke on its own. Stop. Matthew, that's your end of the switch. Stop. Sounds good. I didn't realize my mic was unmuted when I just yelled at the kid. No, tell Matthew. That, that's <laughs> that's all in the recording now. Oh, man. Tell him it's done. Tell him he's got three people now that said it's got to be. All right. I'll talk to you later. <laughs> see you guys. Uh, glad to see you around, Joseph. All right. All right. All right. And for all.